problem. <laughs> so uh, I was asked to speak about this topic here, and I'm uh, instantly going to change the topic and uh, go into uh, speaking about more of uh, what and why. I think it's perfect that I come directly after Daniel because he was speaking a lot about uh, <coughs> what to do, uh, not how, and I want to go. Uh, I want to go from what to how and why, and I'm, I want to start speaking about, or just telling you a little bit shortly about what I've done, so you know who you listen to. Uh, I started my football career in Valer when I was uh, almost 14. I didn't dare to go into football training before the age of 14. I think I watched around 1,000 training uh, uh, in different areas in Reykjavik, in Breidholt, Fram, which is the team that I supported till I found Valur. <coughs> and uh, I never dared to go into training. I was this kid that was stressed about everything. I was scared uh, for everything. I didn't dare to uh, basically say what I thought, what I was uh, what I was thinking, what I wanted to do. And it took me many years to take the bus to Valur. And the, my coach at that time is sitting here, Raka. And uh, when I came there, I planned on the way in the bus that I was, when I was going to be starting playing with the team, I was going to have the number eight on my back. Then I come to the first training and realized that I was probably the worst uh, player on the training ground, and I was definitely not going to have eight, maybe more of a 28 or something. So uh, this is how it all started. Then I realized early that I missed out on the basic training and wanted to become a coach at the age of 16 and started to coach uh, youth teams in Valen when I was 16. And uh, I did that for many years before uh, testing my wings in a small club, Hidewa, which is on an island outside of Iceland, as you know. And uh, I ended up staying there for nine months. It's just, it's a very, like, w when you're pregnant, you, you're you pregnant for nine months, and then you give birth to the baby. For me, this was fairly as difficult because I got tired after nine months, which was horrible at that time, but amazing for me afterwards because I learned so much about myself and I think I realized a little bit more uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, I did not uh, understand at that age of 24 that I was not a great coach. I was a talented coach and my ideas and my strategies were not going to work as well as they were doing in Valor for youth teams, coaching senior athletes. Uh, on an island, and if you know this island, which most of you do, then you, just, you, you don't just drop in there and come in with your ideas and you think they're going to work. They know more what ideas are working on the island, and you have to get uh, adjusted to that before you bring in your ideas. And I learned so much from this. I could have quit. Many people said to me, you're only a youth team coach, so maybe you should go back to that. And I thought about it for some months. Then I went to Breidablik and took on a U19 team, and uh, I wanted to stay in Breidablik for a longer time than I did, so it became 12 years as a, a coach in Valur, one year or nine months in uh, Ibeva, and only one year in Breidablik. I coached the U19 team, we won the Icelandic championship, and I wanted the A team. And they, they did not want to hire me as an A team coach. They did not think I was, that I had the the qualities that were needed for that job, and uh, the little young, arrogant, uh, ambitious coach that I was at that time uh, thought then the best idea would for me to leave. And uh, I ended up being lucky getting the A team in, in uh, Valur, back from Breivik to Valur, uh, coaching the players that I've had for many years in the youth teams. And it was only because uh, many coaches have, had been offered that job and had turned down the offer, and they needed a coach. So I got in there, and uh, I will never be telling the story if it wasn't about us winning the championship in the first year, and four out of my five years as a coach there. And then I wanted to do something different. And 
The reason why I ended up in Sweden has a lot to do with my studies, uh, sports science studies, where I did my assignment in the end of the studies about comparing the preparation and development of young, young uh, female soccer players in Norway, Sweden, and Iceland. And I wanted to study the system and do some research on the system, like how, how you find the talents, uh, how you bring them higher up within the system to national teams, and uh, how they're taken care of. And I really love the system that Sweden had. I, I actually also love the system that Norway had, but Sweden has uh, always been a better uh, or more successful country when it comes to both league and national team than uh, Norway, so I chose Sweden. I thought I would stay there for maybe five, six years. I liked staying at the same place for a long time, but it has uh, ended up being 14. Somewhere on the way through my career, I've I worked for two years uh, for the Icelandic uh, Association as an assistant A national team coach and U21 national team coach, and I worked for two years for the Swedish Association as uh, an assistant coach in U20 and U23. I think it's important for me to explain this to you because everything I will be speaking about now comes from experience and what I believe in, not what you believe in. Uh, many of you are not gonna believe in the same things that I believe in and I don't care. It's just uh, you have to care about what you believe in and you can bring stuff out of my presentation that is great. You can also bring things out of my presentation that you dislike and do it differently. So, how to make a team out of different human beings. That's how I'm gonna change my presentation from athletes to human beings. Because I think uh, a team is, uh, within football, is within a game that is full of strategies. Uh, strategies on the field, strategies in the locker room, uh, in a meeting room, and the preparation through the pre-season, through the in-season, through the off-season, strategies and individual conversations, and so on. So, for me, this complex sport that football is, is about a team that includes a coaching staff, which in my case is six people. I need to explain at this moment here that my club does not own a lot of um, money. We are a, a very small club in Sweden in a town with a population of 45,000. And I have, for example, I have a player budget of four and a half million Swedish kroners, while the five teams around us in the table have a player budget between eight and 13 millions. So <coughs> we are far away from uh, being money-wise as rich as these teams. But I also choose to put more money on my staff than many of these teams do. Why? Because the why is extremely important to me. You don't buy what I'm doing, you, you will buy what, like, why, I, not what I'm doing, why I'm doing what I'm doing. And this is my most important thing today. The staff is here for the players. And our strategy, our game, which can be like playing uh, chess, uh, is impossible without having everybody. So we have a medical team of four people. The teams around us in the table does not have 10 people working for the players. They maybe have between five and eight. So putting more money on these people that is taking care of the players is extremely important for me. Then we have the older players. All of you know that if you coach a team, the older players are special. They're not experts, but they're special. They have more experience, they have more opinions, they've been in maybe seven different clubs, they've been in the national team for I don't know how many years, they're used to having massage, and my medical team says, no, we don't give a massage, then maybe this older player should get the massage so she feels like she's getting what she needs. So, uh, we have goalkeepers, they're also special. Goalkeepers, they, we have three goalkeepers, they, they train 50% of the time, in a totally different way than all the other players. You know this? There is something be behind the goalkeeper that tells us that they are special people. <laughs> and then they need special, then they have special needs. And, and then we have new players. 
like we have four new players now, they come into an environment where everything is new. They're used to this and this and this, but here it's not your this and this and this, it's our this and this and this. So we need to uh, carefully look into uh, who they are and what they're doing. And then we have the young players. And my older players are not going to go to the younger players and say, OK, I've also been young. I've also been 16 years old coming into this team, and I know exactly how it is. Wrong. In many ways, maybe. But just like we were talking about before, there are social media, there are social comparison, there is, uh, there, there is stress going on that is uh, completely different, coming from different stuff than 10 or 15 years ago. So studying what's going on here is not easy for the older players. And I just think they should, uh, they have to understand them, but they also have to learn to understand them. But by having all of this and building a team with all of these people, then I think we can build our strategies. And I, I believe that there is a strategy for everything. Uh, and when people say to me, like, you cannot do this, then of course I, I look at that as crap because uh, if somebody tells me that you cannot win this, or you cannot sign that player, or you cannot not not, then there is a strategy for doing that. And uh, that's basically what I believe in most of the times. And I, I'm, I do this speaking stuff often, and uh, I, I normally have this headline for my uh, topic is that there is a strategy for everything. And uh, uh, what is strategy? I think <laughs> you, you know what it is, but I still think I want to explain how I look at it. It is a plan of action designed to achieve a long term or overall goal. So it doesn't like strategy is not something that you just put in and you use for today. It's like you, you have to build on your strategies, you have to try stuff, and then uh, wait for it to happen over a, a longer period of time. That's what I believe in. So back to this uh, team of human beings. Then we have a new challenge. That is also, just like Daniel was saying, OK, and comparing to Norway, so I have kids. This is a kid coming from the United States. She comes from the university system, where you have to come in and show off for the coach. You never know when you get traded. You never know when you get pulled out of the classroom, because uh, you are like, if you don't do the class 100%, then maybe you can't come to training. This would never happen in Sweden. So in Sweden, uh, I'm coaching a team, and that team has uh, a player from the United States, from Finland, from Holland, uh, from uh, Roots, from Nigeria and Sweden, a Swedish player, and we have a German goalkeeper. They all come from different cultures, and it's not easy to put a team together out of these individuals. But I know that we share these things. We will share the same dreams the same, same goals, the same hopes, the same passion, and the results. And I chose the positive things. There are a lot of negative things around this. We are going to have uh, setbacks. We're going to share them as well. But that's a part of the results. And uh, this is the most important thing for me, both uh, within the player and the, the coach or the person, the staff that's working with me. Who is the person behind the player? Is this easy to know? I think it's, it's the most uh, complicated thing as a coach is to just be the person that cares, that cares that much that you have time and uh, patience to get to know everybody behind the player that you have. This isn't easy, but it's definitely one of my goals is to to get to know the people that I'm working with. Maybe that's why I've been for a long time in the same environment. So not just like what is like who is the person? Right? What knowledge do, does that person have? Now I'm going to talk about what happens when I'm uh, signing a player. So I want to sign in a new player. Some clubs let uh, Börskur do that. And you know what club I'm talking about. 
in Iceland. Okay, some clubs in Sweden let Teres Sjögren do that. She's the sport director in Rosengård. They're the Swedish champions. So when I say let them do that, then the first person that calls that player and books a meeting with the player is some kind of a sporting director or the head over everything in the club. I, I don't want to work like that. I have a sporting director, but the first contact and conversation uh, and the phone call or the email or SMS is made by me. I want to have that contact with the player directly myself. I want to have that first meeting with the player myself uh, in person, if possible. Now we're lucky to have these teams uh, meetings and stuff, so I can also do it that way. But the sporting director most of the time is involved in the conversation and then takes care of the negotiations if we're going to uh, try to come to an agreement with a contract. I don't want to be involved in that. But what I want to know in a meeting or in conversations with players is what knowledge do they have within, the, within football and within uh, uh, the subject team? Like I ask a lot of questions around that. I want to look into uh, what kind of a mindset that player has, and that's just my basic questions that I ask. Mindset is just, it's a huge word. Like you can, I could have a, a special conference about mindset, but I also want to know the purpose and the why, like why do you want to come to us? Why are we sitting in this meeting? Why are you playing football? I think it's important. I want to, uh, I ask questions about are you a vegan or a vegetarian? Do you eat meat? Like is this even relevant? I think it's relevant. I think it's relevant to know what's going on because this will uh, affect all that we were speaking about before, it, there can be a lot of stress around eating and nutrition. Uh, mood and spirit, how kind of a person is this? Is it a, the laughing one or is it a shy one? Or do you take place in the room? Are you a leader? Uh, and that does not mean that I want all the people to be the same. I'm not gonna be crazy and start talking about the color system. Uh, I think that's pretty stupid in a way, but it's also has something in a way. Like you want different people in the room and you want to create a team of different characters. So I like the shy one. If she has great knowledge within football, she reads the game well and all that. I have a player like that on my team today. But I also like the loud one, the leader, and then maybe she can lack something else. Then uh, emotional health. I mean, we all know that's important. What is that? We can also have a, another conference about that. Uh, relationship with people and social status. But I go into social media and uh, spy on people I'm going to sign. Is that wrong? Yeah, maybe that's weird and I don't care. That's a way of doing something. That's my way. Oh, why? Well, uh, a person that is just posting a lot of, uh, so the Twitter, the Twitter account starts like this. Uh, my name is Anna Williams. My opinions are my own. Yeah, yeah your opinions are your own. But at the same time, what's written there is always going to be associated with our club. Like our logo, and it doesn't mean that we stand for what that player is uh, writing or posting about, but it affects our environment. So I do that. I want to know what the, the person is interested in. And you can see a lot on social media today. You could not do this 15 years ago, but definitely now. And then the physical status. So you have to do a, a, a medical test, and you can see through the physical status where you have the player when you get her in. And I think all of these uh, things are important through the time that I'm working with my athletes. My job is a result-based job. When I was coaching youth, it wasn't. Then it was more about development and being a part of the journey towards the result-based job. But I'm definitely, uh, my job is also about development still, but my job is mainly about results. What measures my job is performance. It's the individual performances, it's the team performances, and in Sweden, the media is 
is very keen on talking about performances. Uh, and if you do well, you are God, you know that. If you don't, you are not good. Last best example is the humble team, the national team, playing in my town a couple of weeks ago against uh, Hungary. So a week before that game was played or that tournament started, then uh, our national team coach was very good. Like people were talking about how good he was doing with the team. Some uh, experts out there maybe thought he wasn't. But the global belief was that he was good. And uh, because that's what we read and that's what we believe because of results. And then suddenly, in the middle of the game, leading with seven goals, Gummi is amazing. 15 minutes later, we lose the game and Gummi is the problem. This is our job. This is the head coach. And wrong or right? There, there, is, a, there is no wrong or right. Like, he, he, he lost the game uh, because of strategies. Well, that's what the global belief says today. That's what we read in the newspapers. And uh, so suddenly, I agree also. I did not agree two weeks ago. Uh, a player touches the ball for three minutes in a game. So my Anna touches the ball for three minutes. So what does she do for the other 90 minutes of the game? She's moving around. She is communicating with her teammates, supporting her teammates, or dragging down her teammates, not supporting her teammates. And she's defending. Defending is always off the ball. So I think my job is to break everything down to understanding how I can get the maximum out of the three minutes and optimize these three minutes for the player. But I think it's even more important to understand how I can help the player to be great for the rest of the 90 minutes. And I do believe that the player that is sitting on the bench can affect these minutes uh, as much as I can do. How? That's another conference. So I want to spend the rest of my uh, talk here talking about my strategies. Now, I want to go into what Daniel was talking about before. Is he spoke about from an academic point of view, what I'm going to talk about and dig under the surface of. And I'm going to show you how, what I do to take down the, the stress, to try to make my players feel very good every day, even when they don't feel good. How can we change that during the day or during an hour? And uh, I've never spoken about it in a way that I'm going to do now. So maybe this is going to be horrible. But I, I believe it's going to be great. Uh, but I, I know I'm not going to make it on time. So, uh, and uh, I know that uh, VST doesn't have to speak for an hour. So I can steal some minutes from him. So strategies, these are my strategies. So I work a lot with something that I call a belief system. And we'll dig into what that is. I work a lot with excitement, building excitement. I work a lot with togetherness. And this all goes into the same puzzle somewhere on the way. And I do work a lot with something that I call challenges versus skills. Then all the psychologists in the room understand that I'm going to dig into the flow system. Like it or not. I don't know. I love the flow system. I've had conversations with psychologists that look at me like, uh, put this down. No, I'm not going to put it down because it works great for me. And that's what it's all about. It works great for my athletes. So these four things are my uh, biggest topics for the rest of uh, my speak. And I think uh, the system that I have to work with when I talk about a belief system is a very complex system of challenges. It has to do with technical stuff, tactical stuff, emotional stuff, and all that. But it has to do with individuals. And you, uh, all the time, then 
there is a ghost inside of us. And uh, if you ever read the books that Tim Groover uh, wrote, he was the personal coach of Michael Jordan. And uh, it's, it's a very cliche books, my opinion. And uh, there's a whole book about the same thing. So you read the same thing about 500 times in the book. So it, the book could have been three pages. Uh, you know that? Relentless, right? Have you, uh, have anybody that has written that book? If you haven't, do it, but only read the first three pages and then you know what it's about. So he always talks about the ghost as the dark side. And the dark side is the best part of you, if you can use it right. And uh, yeah, I agree there is some kind of a ghost inside of us. It's, it's the voice that is telling us that we can't do stuff, telling us that we can do stuff. And you wake up in the middle of the night, you know, you know this. Day before a game, a coach or a player, you wake up at two, you have somebody sleeping beside you, that person is not awake. You just wake up. And you're like, oh my God, if we don't win the game tomorrow, I'm gonna, and then, and this, and then it just builds up and you can't control this because it, it just is there. And then either we accept this ghost and we work with this ghost and it becomes a good part of us, yeah. or you just call it a dark side like Tim Gruber, I don't know. But uh, he, he always like, you understand that I, I like his cliche things, even if I don't. But uh, it's a lot about, Michael Jordan was all about this, uh, understanding how, how to go from being good to great to unstoppable. And I've often thought, like, is it possible for a team in a very small town, having no money, uh, to do anything like this? I, there is nothing different with me than coaching Valur. For me, this is just a, it's just a team. And it's just individuals, it's human beings. And if I'm placed in Reykjavik, uh, close to this house, or I'm in uh, Krikansta, uh, developing a team and building a team, I don't think there is a difference. Norway, five and a half million. And they win more medals than USA with having what? 320 million? Yeah. I mean, why is that possible? They just have a plan and strategies of going from being good to great and being unstoppable. And they believe that they are unstoppable. So it all, all goes down to the belief system. And the belief system, when I'm talking to my players, is uh, how far can we come uh, if we put our whole effort on being ourselves? Because I have these uh, conversations constantly with my people, is that you're comparing with other people. And you're like putting so much effort into if we do like this and if we have issues like Rosengord and if we can train in the morning like Rosengord and if we can do this and then the, yeah, I want to play like Seger and I want to be like Margaret and you know, it's, it's just like, I've had these conversations with so many athletes, but if you can put the same effort of your thoughts about how you can become he and she and they and them, into just being you and getting the maximum out of you, I really think you can get extremely far. <laughs> and the belief system is about going all from into a, a conference room with the team in the beginning of the season, saying, this is our year plan. And they go looking at this like, oh my God. Uh, and most of them go directly into seeing something that they are interested in. All the players go into strength and go like, oh, general strength, what is that? Ask about this. But for me, it's just about giving them a plan. Like this is the plan. Many coaches do a year plan and they only show the staff or themselves the year plan. You never show the players the year plan. So I dig into a year plan and I break it down and I have nothing to hide from my players. They need to know what is going on through the year, and if they know that I put a lot of work and energy into preparing them, they're gonna get more happier, they're gonna get more calm, and they know that my coach is working behind the scenes. She's not just, and then they're not guessing. She hasn't planned anything. They know the plan before we go. They know our game cycle. The game cycle can change between uh, years. This is our game cycle today. 
okay, we, and I think you have to do it really clear that the phases go into the next phase. So, okay, we are attacking and then we go into, the attacking is about building up and then we end up in the finishing phase. That's the final third. A 16 year old doesn't understand this, but you're working with a 30 year old, she does understand it. But the 16 year old has no idea what I'm speaking about. If I go, today we're working with finishing phase. And she goes like, that's probably finishing on goal. And how are we finishing on goal? Shooting the ball from the penalty area? I think they need to know how we're gonna get from here and here, creating a goal chance and scoring a goal. How we're defending through a set defense into preventing goals and chances in our own penalty area. And why? Like, why are we doing it this way? And if I can explain that for my players in details, I think I can take a lot away from the swimmer that didn't know how to swim. So they go in and you know exactly what's your role in the system and why is your role in the system like this. So it all goes from, okay, it goes from building up, how? We have principles, general principles, we have operational principles, and then we have another slide that isn't here that is core principles. Read this, study this, know your role, know where there are free rotations, I'll tell them why. I don't want free rotations over here and I'll also tell them why. And then we go into finishing phase, why are you supposed to run into the zone one, why are you supposed to run into the zone three, and then we play another team next week, so one, two, and three might change. Why? Because of the opponents and how we see that they are defending sometimes and through many years as a coach, I did a mistake not explaining this in details. So I knew why I was changing the runs to zone one and two and three, but I did not explain for them why we are changing the zones. And I think by uh, doing this, uh, more, 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 and more clearly, suddenly everything starts to make so much sense for the 16-year-old, for the 30-year-old, and everybody. For example, so have, we have a principle in our finishing phase is that we almost never cross the ball in the air. And then you have these old guys in the stands, and our stands on our home arena is so close to us, and I can hear them like bent orchestra screaming behind me, why don't you cross the ball? Shoot from outside the penalty area. Okay, and uh, he doesn't know that our principles are don't shoot from outside the penalty area if you're not Amanda or Carly. Don't cross the ball in the air unless you're in this zone. That's the only place you can cross the ball. Why? Because crossing the ball a lot from this area is catched by the goalkeeper eight times out of ten or headed out from a defender. There are facts behind this. There are statistics that show us this. So you have a counterattack against you. You're taking high risks of playing with, I don't know what, eight players around the penalty area. That's how we want to play. I don't want counterattacks against us. So the why behind we're doing this, it's just really, really easy to explain. And it takes them really far with knowledge, which is extremely important. And then, why did we want to have six players out and four in when having the ball? The bo that's not about keeping the ball, scoring, scoring goals, doing this, doing that. It's about the 90 minutes where they don't have the ball. Because if we lose it with six out and four in, we are definitely going to win it in a counter pressure most of the times. So suddenly you lose it here in a perfect place to go chasing the ball, closing a pass, going in with narrow positions and winning the ball directly. So I'm going to jump through this, and we have paces like this. This is actually a great one uh, uh, from Portugal. I did not, nothing is like, uh, I didn't do this. I didn't make this. This is taken from different people, different inspirations. And for me, this is so great to say to a player, okay, how are we going to go counterattack? Well, we want the first touch is forward and high speed and get to the lowest number as fast as possible. So, Amelia, an Icelandic 16 year old that I have, she would be like, go fast as possible, attack with maximum runs, forward, exploit the space on the wings. See, there she loses focus. 
But when I show her that we want to get to the lowest number as fast as possible, then she automatically understands that. We're going to one. And then she goes as fast as possible to one. So you were not in here when I said that I'm going to steal time from you. <laughs> now then you steal lunch time, OK? <laughs> Great. So uh, we build our own house. And uh, we are the only people that can build our own house. So uh, that is the togetherness. Uh, and uh, what do we bring to our house? So obviously, uh, our house is, I don't know, the environment, maybe? So you can bring passion. You can bring doubts. You can bring hopes. You can bring, bring all of this. Negative vibes, positive vibes, sadness, whatever. You can talk about problems before they come. So you can choose to come into the locker room and speak to your teammates and say, I haven't been training. Like, I have not been in the starting team through the whole training week. I'm not playing on Saturday. OK? You can choose to say that to somebody. Or you can choose to say, I actually, I'm going to make it to the starting team even if I haven't been training with the starting team the whole week. So what's your conversation in there? We speak a lot about this. What is allowed to bring into our house? And uh, why is that not allowed? Why is it allowed? So what do we allow? Obviously, positive things. I think uh, I don't want the same people uh, in the locker room. Like I said before, I don't think we need the, the loud leader or the, the, uh, the laughing one that is saying jokes the whole time. Imagine if you had 20 like that. That would be a disaster. But uh, you can have the one, like I have a player on my team that I know that uh, some people relate to when I say this, that doesn't speak at all. She has problems speaking. She has problem uh, communicating with other people. But she has extreme skills. She's so good, technically good, reads the game, uh, all of this. She cannot say a word to anybody. So what I work with her on doing is that when you come in, you can come in with a smile. So if you suddenly come in with a smile, then people smile to you, and you suddenly feel better. You, you don't have the same anxiety coming into the room. You, are, you have anxiety about, she says that to me, she has anxiety about somebody wanting to speak to her. So we just all know that she isn't speaking, and we have accepted that. That's what we do in our house. Probably not in a different house, but uh, a smile and a hug, it does a lot. And that's positive vibes, obviously. So what we also, uh, when we build our house, we decide this together. It's very easy to decide stuff like this. But it's not as easy to follow it. And I think this is a culture that is built over time. But I've also seen that it doesn't matter if this is done in Valor or this is done in uh, Kristianstad. It's the same. I think the team that I had in Valor and the team that I have now is a very identical. I think it's just about the leadership behind it. This is not about me. It's about somebody building an environment and other people becoming a part of it and then keeping it alive. I think I can leave tomorrow, and I'm pretty sure that this would be alive for a pretty long time. This is how people see us, and I know that people see us like this. But we also decide that we want people to see us like this. And then they do. And we also do this uh, uh, related to football. So I signed uh, five new players last year, and I realized I missed out on a, a very important detail. So none of them was tall. And none of them was good on set pieces. And I suddenly realized that the identity that we normally have is that we are great on set pieces. So I realized that maybe we're not going to be great at set pieces this year. Then we just decided as a group that we were still going to be great at set pieces. It doesn't have to do with height. So we decided to talk about, in the locker room, to media, a lot to media, and to fans. And make everybody, including the opponents, believe that we are the strongest team of all in this situation. We let in one goal from a set piece last year. And everybody was speaking about how great they are on set pieces. 
it didn't have anything to do with abilities or physical uh, strength or whatever. It had to do with something totally different. And we also own the design of our house. Like, what is, what are we putting in there? Like, uh, excitement. I think excitement is a huge part of what, uh, what we do. And I think uh, I was actually pretty, uh, I was so, I don't know how to like, I was doing a documentary with Gulli Jones for a few years, a few years ago. And he told me that what people are saying about my environment in Valor was that we were a cult. And I was like, cult? Cult is not a positive word. And then I also realized that when doing this documentary, that people also spoke about Krihansta as a cult. They're a cult. Nobody wants to leave this cult. And this cult is just, they do weird stuff. And then uh, I just decided to see this as a positive thing. I mean, we're not going to end up in, a, in the same house and kill ourselves. <laughs> I mean, it's just about performing in sports and do it in our way. So I think we do a lot about building excitement. And how do you do that? It's not complicated, but sometimes you have to go out of your comfort zone, maybe. So uh, it's all this little, little stuff. And the little stuff can be this. So I want to show you a jacket that is uh, in the background of this picture. You can see that it's a, it's a very nice jacket with our old logo. And this jacket has been alive for at least 10 years. So every year, a player gets the jacket, and she is uh, the head of the welcome committee. So she takes the jacket on every single time a new player is coming in, somebody is coming on tryouts. We have a young player com coming from the youth teams. Uh, even if we have a new coach, if, the, if a national team coach is visiting us, uh, then uh, Josephine Harrison, who is our welcoming committee this year, she comes out and she says, hey, hey, uh, welcome to the club. Welcome uh, to the day. We're doing this and this. Here are your clothes. This is where you're sitting. If you need anything, you just come to me. I'm your best friend today. So suddenly the, the, the little 16-year-old that came into the first training just goes from being like this to like, oh, I have Harrison. And I know where I'm sitting, and I have nothing to worry about. And it seriously is like that. Uh, and then we have uh, something we call the king. A lot of people, of course, now, 2023, why don't you call it a queen? You're women. I don't know. It's just a king. And we decided that it was a king 12 years ago, and it's just a king still, and will be a king. So we just found this. I don't know what, we stole this from Spain on a restaurant because we felt like it was ours. <laughs> and we just painted it and we uh, gave it a name, the KDF of King. And this goes between, so if after a win, uh, the excitement is coming on, they know what's gonna happen, they know that somebody's gonna be picked the king. The king is not the best player on the field. The king is always a player that gave something special today Maybe the girl that never speaks and has difficulties communicating and suddenly did some, some small steps, and then she is the king in the end of the game. And we go dancing, and it's the same song for 12 years on the floor with Jennifer Lopez. And, uh, and uh, then as some things are added on the way. So suddenly there are gloves uh, coming on. You would usually use it in the garden. Uh, planting flowers, but I don't know why this is on. It's just funny, and uh, they're happy, and they go laughing, and, they, and the hormones come out, and everybody just loves winning. And then somebody added this last year, that in the end of the win, uh, we uh, flip this uh, thing. That is, every player is on the board, and the coaches and the medical team, and you win something, and there is a, a really great prize. So everybody goes screaming, and this moment is a ceremony, and it takes like 15 minutes. And they can't wait to get there. So I, had a Serb I have a Serbian goalkeeper coach, and he said to me, I'm never going to go dancing on a floor and be like <laughs> blah, 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 just telling you. And he meant it. He just said to me, I'm not doing this. 
I'm not used to this, I'm not doing this. And I said, I'm not gonna force you to do it, but I'm pretty sure in a few years that, or months or weeks or whatever, that you, one of them. So suddenly this guy is just dancing, <laughs> a little extra, right? Because you're a part of something bigger. And if you think this is new, this is 2022, and now I have a perfect video from 2012. Mm -hmm. And this is just because Margaret is here, mm -hmm. And everybody who knows Margaret, the psychologist and the former best football player of Iceland, and is never like, she is never loud outside the locker room. But she's also been the king and been involved in the king situation. So maybe let's see what we can find here. So, okay. So here's the king and then the excitement and you just lose yourself. And you're really <laughs> lucky that we don't have any sound on right now. <laughs> Uh, Save is also there. Save and Guni are three yeah. Icelandic players there. But Margaret normally doesn't do this. But I'm just, I want to tell you that this is 2012 and I was about to get fired. And we all knew that if we will, don't win this game, I, I will get fired. And I think there was a little bit of an extra thing. We win the game, the excitement was so big, she just lost it. One of my favorite moments after the game. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so I'm almost done. So involvement, active role in decision making. It's difficult to give players an active role because you're a control freak as a head coach. And I think active role and involvement has to be, like I realized a few years ago that I was extremely bad at this. Giving good roles to my coworkers giving active roles to my coworkers, giving active roles to my players. Uh, three years ago, we were playing uh, for a Champions League spot. And we had lost, we had not won three games in a row. We were playing against the team in, in the bottom of the table and we needed to win. And I decided to give them the set pieces and just say to them, you are the ones that are supposed to perform this on the field. Can you please just design the set pieces. So I divided them up to three groups. One group got free kicks and they also got, they got free kicks. And I thought they would come up with the, like, you know, these great free kicks around the penalty area. And I wanted them to present the ideas to me. This is actually the, the actual whiteboard. This is the actual whiteboard from a, a group that designed free kicks on own half. We don't want to just give a long ball. We want to be able to play it short. Uh, play it from the overload to the isolated one, and then uh, come up with a cross and score. Okay? And I said, fine, we're, we're, you, we do your stuff. This is the game, and I want to highlight that we're in the 90th minute about to lose a point that we will not take a Champions League spot if we don't win this game. And we have a, a free kick or first uh, offside situation that is not offside, and I, of course, freak out. <laughs> and remember, you freak out in a moment like this, also the players, and you lose focus. Because the only focus goes into being frustrated, and this is where I get frustrated, and I would not be able to communicate something calm in that moment. But the players were so excited about the free kick coming now from that uh, offside. So if we roll through this a little bit faster, they're planning this, so excited, running up to their positions. Uh, she knows what's going on, the short one. She was in the group designing this, she was, and she was. So an isolated player coming towards the penalty area and we have won, both of them in the group designing this. We scored the winning goal on the 90, first minute, and everyone in the group was involved in the free kick. So I really, like, I was, I couldn't speak after this, because I was like, it's amazing to see how people can get to plan something, and they get so excited about it, that the focus was there, even in a frustrated moment, in the end of the game, where they normally go running to the referee. They didn't, because they had a plan, and they had something that was going on. And then it's my favorite psychology shit, and that's the flow model. So, I don't know, it was just a coincidence that I saw this uh, a few years ago. 
And uh, the flow model is nothing new. It's just, like I said, it's, uh, you, you can look at it. I'm going to go back and take cattle away. So you, we can look at it in a way that there is a challenge line and there is a skill line or a ability line. So I use this exactly like this. This can be extremely complicated, but obviously, if you read this and you look at this, and how often haven't I, I Googled flow for the first time a few years ago because we won seven games in a row, and I was constantly saying in media, we're in a flow. We are in a flow. Okay, and then I was like, what is flow? <laughs> like, I, I actually have no idea what flow is. So I went uh, Googling this and I realized that flow is something. And you want your athletes and your people, I want to be there. I want to be somewhere on the right side. It's okay to be here in the relaxation at some point and control and flow. But uh, I, I don't want to be here. I don't want my people to be here. And I felt a little bit like this when I left Valor. I could relate to it so, so uh, clearly that I was getting bored like a little bit not excited about what I was doing, then it's time to leave. And I don't want a player to be here. A player came to me last year and said, this was a boring game. Okay, we beat them 2-0. You had an injured goalkeeper playing in the goal. What's boring? It was just boring. I never had the ball and, uh, and I was like, okay, I need to look at the challenges here. Like she, she doesn't understand where she's at. And uh, I, I, I like this woman, also a lot of cliches. She wrote a book that is like, you are what you think. And then you can read that book and you can get some good things out of it and also some cliche things. But uh, she talks a lot about two different mindsets. And I'm just going to focus on the growth mindset because that's what I believe in is that you can grow a mindset. You can get in a lot of stuff to a mind that uh, isn't there. And challenges and get like in a growth mindset, the challenges are exciting rather than threatening. So rather than thinking, oh, I'm going to reveal my weaknesses, you will say, whoa, here is a chance to grow. And, and I like to see the environment that we have built that uh, people come in and they feel like I can grow here. And, uh, and I think uh, this is what I, I I believe in this. I believe that no matter if you're in that wave or you're swimming in Ironman or you're just being the 90-year-old uh, making some art, he's doing this the whole day. He's doing this probably 55 times before it's great. He, has, he also has to be in the flow to uh, get there. Or uh, being really focused on drawing something, biking or just playing football. I don't care. It's just... Uh, you want all of this in. You want the time to fly. You want the pause to go down. You want, a, you want a deeper breath. You seriously want joy and satisfaction. And for me, I work a lot with the challenge and the skills and trying to understand how I can uh, help a player to go from the 16-year-old walking into the locker room being like, OK, I don't know anybody here. I don't know where to sit. I don't know what clothes to have. And then she was just. Uh, very high on this. But just from Harrison coming to helping her and all this and knowing exactly what was going to come, she probably just maybe went into a little bit of relaxation and, and, and felt like she could be there. And I also believe that a player in a position, if she gets just uh, uh, small tasks, very clear tasks before a game, this is before a game we played last Saturday, She's playing a new position, a wing back, and I just gave her main focus points for the coming games, for the coming two games. This is what you're focusing on when we don't have the ball. And I, I just put it in again and again and again, and then I know that she will end up here. She's 33, and she was nervous. New position, I don't know anything. So she could have, playing her position and been here, she could have also ended up here not knowing what to focus on. So, with all these small ingredients, uh, I try to build strategies that I believe can build a team, and it all just ends up with a, 
11 orange people running on the field and another people sitting on the bench or sitting in the stands and the rest of the staff and everybody around it chasing the same dreams and the goals and believing in it. And uh, as more detailed than this uh, could not be done in uh, 56 minutes, I stole a lot of time. No but we fixed that right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.